Well, let's take a formal beginning, take a deep breath and tune in to this exciting podcast where we'll talk with Laura George. And let me introduce Laura to all of you. I've had the pleasure of working with her quite intensely lately, and I'm so impressed with this woman, and I can't wait for you to meet her. Uh, Reverend Laura George, JD, so she's both a reverend and a lawyer, is executive director of the Oracle Institute, which she'll tell you all about an educational charity and think tank that studies the nexus between religion, politics, human rights, and conscious evolution. Oracle offers a wide variety of progressive programs, including a spirituality school, an award-winning publishing house, and international peace practices. Laura is also a trustee at World Constitution and Parliament Association, a steward at Earthwise Center, and an active member of the oldest women's peace group, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, we call it WILF, as well as a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Council that Michael and I are both part of. Uh, she's the author of the award-winning Oracle Trilogy, The Truth, The Love, and The Light, which we'll get into talking about later in the hour. And she serves as lead minister at Oracle Temple. Oracle is headquartered at the Peace Pentagon, which you can see in the background of Laura's picture there and um, in Independence, Virginia, along the New River. It's also home to the Valley of Light micro community, co-founded by Laura and other cultural creatives. She's currently helping, and we're gonna talk about this a lot today, to spearhead the Founding Mothers Movement, a strategic plan to unite women's groups, manifest gender equality, and end war. So join us for an inspiring conversation. Welcome, Laura. So happy that you could make time doing all those things that you're doing <laughs> and make time to be here. You are a busy woman. And she always returns emails very quickly, too. <laughs> so let's begin by, we'd like to start with, what's your backstory? I know you used to work as a lawyer, and you migrated from that into your vision of the Oracle Institute. And tell us, you know, what and motivated you to leave that practice? And what was your vision for the Oracle Institute? Right, so I almost have had like two lives. The first half of my life was relatively normal. Uh, I practiced law in the Washington DC metropolitan area. I was married and I have three children. And the event that forever altered the trajectory of my life was 9-11. Living right outside of Washington DC, um brought it home i think even more well not more than anyone living in new york city but similarly i was greatly impacted by the event and realized pretty darn quickly that it was not what they were telling us um the 9 11 report didn't even mention tower seven okay. and i'm not by nature conspiratorially minded but i knew immediately the whole thing was a fraud Anyway, so 9-11 Truth, and I also, as an attorney, represented architects and engineers, so I was very up to date on what the 9-11 uh, the Truth site for architects and engineers were saying about finding thermite and all of that. So that just started this cascading sequence of spiritual encounters um, that was always in me, had been in me as a child, but it was like all of a sudden my left brain shut down and my right brain opened. It was that dramatic. 
So I quit the practice of law and we started the Oracle Institute in Northern Virginia. And it started out as an interfaith charity, but up there in that cosmopolitan area, it felt very much like we were preaching to the choir. And we'll get into maybe levels of consciousness later in the show, but people by and large up there in Northern Virginia and DC are pretty, if not world centric, pretty darn close. So took it on as a challenge to move to the tip of the Bible Belt. And so I'm down here in the Appalachian Mountains, the southwest tip of Virginia, and we're pretty much the only game in town for about a hundred mile radius. So we're the local rep for a whole bunch of progressive and pluralistic nonprofits, including like United Religions Initiative, we're a chapter for them, World Beyond War. Um, what else do we do? Women's March stuff. So we have a lot of partnerships with other groups because it's been hard to get a foothold here, quite frankly. And it, it was a really rough start, rougher than I thought. I actually had to sue my new hometown twice. So those are two fun stories. I don't know if you want to go into them. But um, anyway, I was not giving up this vortex of light. I am, I am, I live in Shangri-La. This place is Nirvana. It is breathtakingly beautiful. The New River is the oldest river in America, the Western Hemisphere, and some geologists think in the world. Um, it's just stunning and soul enriching to be in this environment. So anyway, that's that's the quickie backstory. Well, that's amazing. Um, yeah, uh, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, so so just to continue the trajectory, as you said, Laura, you started the Oracle Institute, right, as interfaith, but now it's more, it's interfaith, but more because it's also a, well, well, the words behind you, sacred activism, but it's activism, it's, um, I don't know, political is the right word, but just, just very forward looking in terms of societal transformation. So how did that trajectory continue? Well, this thing happened in 2016 <laughs> uh, called the election of Donald Trump. And it's not just that we've been we've witnessed globally, by the way, not just in the United States, a 20 year decline in democracy. And so our belief in religious pluralism and, you know, one God, many path teachings we started out blossomed into basic civil rights. Um, so yeah, we are all in when, when the Supreme court reversed Roe v. Wade, that to me was the final straw. So we are almost exclusively now working on peace. Uh, we're working on conserving what we've, what, what we haven't lost and getting back the lost ground. Um, and I just seem to be a weird magnet for things. For instance, the Federalist Society which is leading not only uh, Project 2025, but a rash of ordinances around the nation decided they were gonna come east of the Mississippi River and pick a purple state and test out a little anti-abortion ordinance, guess where? Independence, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing was ridiculously illegal. A municipality cannot override state law. And in Virginia, it's basically been codified. Roe v. Wade, we've got a trimester uh, schemata for abortion rights here. So I almost had to sue the county for a third time. <laughs> um, so having, having that tool in my tool belt, having been an attorney for the first half of my life has been really important to the work. And I think it's gonna become even more important because of what we're about to launch. We're, we're going all in. Yeah. All, we just, right. all in. The Founding Mothers Movement, which we will get to shortly. But just a little bit more about the Oracle Institute, because you say it operates as a think tank and that you're analyzing various sectors of society and mapping it. So what are you discovering in that analysis, in that research? Yeah, we really do operate as a think tank. We're watching the world um, on a number of fronts. Uh, as, as I said before, it started out in terms of religiosity, watching what was happening with, but, but then that led to looking at theocracies and then we're right back to civil rights. Um, we're also, I knew Barbara Marks Hubbard and Barbara came to the Peace Pentagon. 
one of her famous quotes is that we need a peace room as sophisticated as a war room. And when she visited us um, and we were alone in the chapel of the Pentagon, I said, Barbara, well, if you got that download, why did you never build it? And she looked at me and she said, well, I guess I knew one day you would. Hmm. And I do feel like I picked up on her stream of, or part of her life assignment. So I, we're taking quite seriously this notion of a peace Pentagon. Um, one of our memes we run is, do you know Virginia has two Pentagons? And more and more people know now that Virginia does have two Pentagons. So there's a lot of, uh, well, the building is all based on sacred geometry. Um, for those of you who, are into also American history. I found out after the fact, the numbers we use for the building are five and 11. So like the exterior walls are 55 feet long. I learned after the fact that the Washington Monument is also based on five and 11. The exterior walls are 55 feet long. It's 555 feet tall. And so there's a lot of like a Masonic thing running through the project. There's absolutely, um, a constitutional theme, uh, the founding fathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison are all from Virginia. And our mission statement is Thomas Jefferson's Act for Religious Freedom. He was so proud of that, that on his tombstone, he wanted three things recorded, the Declaration of Independence, founding the University of Virginia, where I attended undergrad, by the way, and then the Act for Religious Freedom, because it was the first one passed, and it's still the law of the land of Virginia. So there's a strong patriotic sub theme running through our work, even from the get go. And we thought we were going to be more working on interfaith. But as I said, now with the status of what's happening in this country and around the world, um, we are mapping the loss of democracy and we're brainstorming what to do about it in the short period of time we have left. Mm -hmm. Well, that yes. right with Michael, who's making a film on saving democracy. Yeah, yeah, it's like pretty much an all hands on deck effort right now. It's not one yes. person who can do it. Um, so, so we mentioned the Oracle Institute, and behind you is the picture of the Peace mm -hmm. Pentagon. So, what's ooh, looks good. I like the river behind it. So, what what is the relationship between Oracle Institute, Peace Pentagon? Um, if you could explain that. Oh, well, the Peace Pentagon is just the name of the building. It's uh -huh. not a separate entity. The reason we, we've been using that brand more is because we've discovered that sometimes spiritual new agey people go like this. When you talk about politics, they don't read the news. They have no idea what's going on in the world. And vice versa, we've learned by working with some hardcore activists if you use the word God, smoke comes out their ears. So, you know, anyway, so we we, we just bifurcated the brands for that reason. Um, but yeah, technically the Peace Pentagon is just the name of the building. It's our headquarters. Oh. It's also the headquarters for <clears throat> the Earth Federation movement in the United States. And it's the headquarters that um, Earthwise Institute uses in the United States. So again, we love affiliating and now we just opened up a uh, wolf branch women's international league for peace and freedom out of the peace pentagon so the goal is to share the facility it's open to the public it has a public library um yeah and make it a, a place where again cultural creatives can come and co-create and brainstorm and strategize and save the planet before it's too late and we haven't even talked about the rest of the poly crisis, right? We've been talking about democracy, but AI is right around the corner. I, I mean, it's, as you said, all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're in quite a time. And yeah. how interesting that you are living in a place where the founding fathers started the country and set up all the tenets and laws and agreements and constitution upon which our country is founded. And that now you are founding the Founding Mothers Movement, which I can't wait to get into because I have had the privilege of working with Laura for a few months now 
on the founding mothers movement. And when I first heard about this in the evolutionary leaders synergy group of feminine force collaboratory that I, I'm part of, I went, she's got a plan. <laughs> this is not an airy fairy. Oh, we're just going to wave our hands and everything is magically going to resolve into the beautiful world. We know our hearts is, it is possible. Here is a realistic woman with a concrete step-by-step -step plan for creating a movement of movements. And so I know a lot of our listeners signed up today to hear about this Founding Mothers Movement, which will launch on June 24th, the second anniversary of Roe v. Wade being overturned. So tell us what the Founding Mothers Movement is, um, how that came to you and uh, what you have to say about it, what, what you hope to accomplish with it. Well, I will share that um, in meditation, I get messages. And one of them was about 15 years ago, build the Peace Pentagon. So building the Peace Pentagon. And then my earnest desire for the last year or two has been, why? Why am I building the Peace Pentagon? I really don't think it's just to do retreats. And boy, did it come in. Um, as Anadea said, we were part, we were part of this um women's collaboratory with the evolutionary leaders. And we asked everybody to do a one page proposal for what the group should do. And this thing just poured out of me. I think it started at around 25 pages. It's up to about 40 pages, this white paper. And it just, it was like I was channeling something. And as Anadea said, it's a true strategic plan. Like in, in the same vein as Gandhi had a strategic plan. Martin Luther King had a strategic plan. This isn't, let's get a bunch of posters and stand on the street corner. I, um, the website has the strategic plan, most of it on it right now, but part, a critical component of it is establishing the Women's Congress. So let me talk about that for a minute. Julia Ward Howe wrote the Mother's Day Proclamation in the late 1800s, I think it was 1870, and it was after the Civil War. And it was a call to women to convene to discuss peace because of the carnage of that hellacious battle. Um, and women heard the call. So they started meeting, um, I think they met for the first time in 1878 in Paris, and then they met all around the world. Um, and in 1915, they rebranded. So that's when Wolf comes into play. So a bunch of suffragettes in America rebranded it as International League for Women, sorry, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And they've continued to this day. In fact, I just attended their 33rd Congress a couple of weeks ago. So one of the goals of the Founding Mothers Movement is to reimagine this Congress. Right now you have to be a member of Wolf to attend. And our idea is that women's groups should be attending. Every women's group on the planet should be sending a delegate. So that's that's sort of the new template that we're hoping Wolf will adopt. If not, we're going to do it anyway. Um, and we're following the suffragette playbook. Um, in order to win the vote, they 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 partnered with churches. And they partnered with peace groups. So that was this trifecta they had going. What we're doing is we're adding spiritual groups. I mean, sorry, environmental groups. Had they existed a hundred years ago, they probably would have joined that coalition too. So the plan is, you know, step one, women's groups, step two, peace groups, spiritual groups, and then environmental groups. Then what we're envisioning is something that has never happened on the planet. And the only reason it's possible is because of technology but the other reason it's possible is i do believe the consciousness level of the planet is high enough that we can pull this off and what has never been done before is a movement of this magnitude nothing like this has ever happened before we've seen things like occupy which was a disorganized protest that did go global um, but they had no list of demands. The media didn't know who to talk to. They were following this leaderless, ridiculous template. Um, and it's not just Occupy. I've been studying up a lot on all the movements of the 21st century, and almost all of them have failed. 
and they fail because no one thinks about the day after. So even if you think you've won the first round and your opponents are like, okay, 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 we'll give in. They don't give in <laughs> or the next ring out more manipulative ring out of those in power step in and Arab Springs a perfect example I remember cheering during Arab Spring right so they get rid of their dictator but what happened the military took over and they're worse off than they were before so this planning not just for escalating campaigns to let the opponent know you're serious and and doing that quite respectfully in the way that Gandhi and Martin Luther King did it's then what do you do? And this is the yucky part. It's policy. It's 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 getting a bill passed in Congress. It's it's legal work. It's yucky stuff that people don't want to do. So the first stage is yes, protests and strikes and letting that escalate, direct action that can also become non-cooperation. But then even after you quote win the goals, what does that look like? So this strategic plan is taking all of that into account, all of it, and it's a two-year plan. The average uh, successful nonviolent ca campaign lasts three to four years. The average war that's successful lasts eight. So it is now totally established um, that nonviolent resistance is more effective than violence. Um, so basically we've sketched out maybe half of the time needed for this campaign, but we are darn serious about it. And we have the technology to sync up the world. And we've got a governance plan for the Women's Congress. And we're about to, we just started inviting women's groups in and soon we'll be inviting the other parts of the coalition. And you're working with an incredible group of core women to get this started. I and mean, we have yeah. women from all over the world, women from Africa, Ukraine, and Russia, women from The Hague, from the UN. I mean, these are some high-powered women coming together to work with you on this. I'm very honored and humbled to be uh, among this company. It's uh, quite something to watch this come and take shape so quickly and so, so well. It really promises to be quite a thing. So what are your goals? Okay, they're really simple, super, <laughs> super simple. It's women in war. It's the full empowerment. And by that, we mean civil rights, nothing mushy, like an international or a, an ERA that's passed by every nation. So that's the woman piece. Because again, research shows when women are empowered, the whole, the whole community rises, everything gets better. When women have the ability to impact decision-making, it's the shift that we've been looking for, right? I mean, yeah, and, and, women, and with yeah. partnership, let me, let me add. But anyway, so women is the first piece, war is the second piece, and there it's just like, just stop. Stop. Stop making war. It's so easy, really. Um, now, in order to do that, we're going to need a legislative body with... Um, or sorry, a judicial body with mandatory jurisdiction. So logically, that's the International Court of Justice. Um, and right now it's voluntary. Nation states can decide if they do or they don't want to go before that court. Um, so the flip side of women in war then is partnership and peace, right? So the goal is to create a society in which both men and women feel the same opportunities, have the same uh, ability to thrive, their dreams are possible, um, and they're working in concert with one another in a way that hasn't happened many times in human history. So it's not like we're pumping matriarchy to take down patriarchy. It's not like that at all. Um, and then the peace part is obviously the flip side of the war. And we do have a peace plan. So the Founding Mothers Manifesto will focus on those two goals. And from those, we think trickle down, everything else will flow. So for instance, AI, I mentioned it a few minutes ago. If we're able to transition the military industrial complex into an interim peacekeeping force, you know, we're, we can hopefully convince them to stop I mean, DARPA is the largest investor in AI. I mean, they're, they're, they're creating machines that are going to kill on command. There's just no doubt about it. We already have them. So 
it'll trickle down to that. It'll trickle down to environmentalism in the sense that again, when when women's voices are heard, for some reason, I'm not sure why, but it just seems that women's connection to the earth is stronger and we are more concerned with with Mother Earth. Um, and that's just that's just the general rule. Obviously, there are great, I mean, Bill McKibben's leading 350.org. God bless him. Um but yeah, if if we can get women empowered and stop war, that's the ship. I mean, that's the ship we've all been waiting for. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So I, I saw on the um, Founding Mothers Movement website you quoted, um, uh, quoted, but wrote the uh, Erica Shenowitz's um, four principles for change or whatever but erica chenoweth is the harvard-based um researcher professor who came up with the three and a half percent rule um for creating societal transformation um you want to say more about that well i'm not up on it as much as you are i'm afraid i know what you're talking about but and she is one of the authors that we're having um women involved read her body of work at the mm -hmm. center of the Congress will be a peace room. And the qualifications for that is going to be knowing the research that, that Erica does and that other, um, not just academics. I mean, the, the activists themselves are now recording what they have learned over the last, you know, 20, 50 years. But no, I'm I can't remember the three percent thing. Sorry. Well, the three and a half percent rule simply is that when three and a half percent of a population becomes um, involved in a nonviolent um, demonstration, civil disobedience, that's when change mm. does happen. And she made she her findings are based on the research of all movements that have happened over last century or more. Um, yeah. So so. You know whether whether we're talking about just American society or or the world, you know that's um, you know that's the basis of it. Um, I would put the percentage maybe a little. I'm more on the Wilbur camp. I think we need about ten percent of the planet to comprehend not just the reason for movements, but accept. And here's the other tricky part: anchor the change. Because you know the election of Barack Obama is a perfect example. Look at the backlash against us having our first African American or half African uh, president. It, who would have thought? I mean, I, my best friend in high school is a black woman, and I called her up and I said, Tony, everybody is saying on TV, oh, yeah, we knew America was this racist. I'm not surprised. So I, I called her up and I said, Are you surprised? And she said, Hell yeah, I'm surprised. She said, I didn't know. She goes, I knew it was bad. I mean, I live, I'm African American and I live in a society in which racism still exists. But I thought it was so interesting that she was shocked as well. So the spiral is collapsing. For those of you who know spiral dynamics, the spiral is collapsing, is what's happening. And the darkest face of these memes are coming out. So you know, an old school nationalist, and this is the greatest generation. These are the people who fought World War II, right? I mean, every meme has an upside and every meme has a shadow. But the old school nationalists are becoming neo-nationalists. And people who, you know, used to be middle America are now worried about money and they're becoming nationalists. And then pluralists are also getting nervous and they're worrying about money and becoming more, you know, focused on materialism. So the whole first tier is collapsing and we need to turn that around so anyway wilbur's theory is if we can get 10 percent of the planet past the tipping point that will usher in change that can hopefully stay anchored but i love the whether it's three and a half percent or ten percent not only is it possible now because of the the state of consciousness the collective consciousness on the planet but we don't have any other choice if we don't do this, the human experiment is going to end. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to end. I mean, we're not going to all go out we're like cockroaches, but the peak of civilization, in my view, was actually back in the 1970s, in America anyway. 
Um, yeah, it's been a slow decline since Reagan, 1980. The value sets have been diminishing, I think. Well, you know, in the fourth turning, they described these cycles <laughs> and that we are right in the heart of the destructive cycle. And one thing they say is that when society is in that stage, um, people resonate with negative talk. They resonate with the kind of things Donald Trump says, you know, and they don't resonate with the positive vision because they have this unconscious sense that things are falling apart. And so they become enrolled in that and it becomes yeah. like a, you know, what it seems watching the news is that it's like a snowball that I wouldn't believe would ever have caught any traction is rolling down the hill and getting bigger and bigger and getting more and more traction and people are just assuming the world's collapsing and assuming donald trump's going to be president and assuming yeah. all of this and it's like whoa <laughs> um you know it, it, it's really well, wake up everyone and stop this snowball um but you know you were talking about the backlash of racism that came from barack obama's presidency and we've all seen that um, but there is a backlash against feminism right now. Right. Both. And I'd yep. like you to speak to that because it is intensifying, not decreasing. It is absolutely intensifying. And if you're watching the Republican platform formation around the nation, like Texas is working on its uh, Republican platform right now. I mean, it just it just gets worse every day. I mean, they, now they're talking about birth control, regulating birth control or taking away certain forms of birth control. So pro if your listeners aren't familiar with Project 2025, it might be worth a minute to talk about that. So about 100 right wing think tanks have come together and they're not just right wing, they're they're all right. And Project 2025 is a massive strategic plan to completely restructure the United States of America if they're able to get Trump elected. And it's not just, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there with the judiciary. No, they're going to gut the federal system um, and, and do away with things like the EPA. And anyway, so... The Project 2025, when I discovered it and learned of it a few months ago, also ties in with the Founding Mothers Movement because they're going to start January 1st of 2025 or maybe January 20th, you know, for the uh, inauguration. Well, we're starting January 1st as well. And between now and January 21st of 2025, which, by the way, was the date they predicted in the fourth turning that all hell would break loose. They called it a book 17 years old and they called it, they said it'd be 2025. Anyway, I love that book. And it's not, I like what's in it, but I love the book in the sense that it is so worth a read if you want to understand the cycles and seasons of history and how it works with archetypes and those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it sort of stuff. Um, but back to when we're launching so that that leaves us not much time um we've got eight seven months now left um and in that seven months the founding mothers need to draft the manifesto which of course is a huge piece of the movement we are hoping to have that published october 2nd which is international day of peace it also is uh, mahatma gandhi's birthday um, that would be one month before the U.S. presidential election and then just three months before the start of the year. So basically, we'd be putting the world on notice three months. And then the founding mothers are going into action and not just the founding mothers, the founding brothers who are coming along with us. So. Again, it's a serious strategic plan, which will be hopefully Im greatly improved once the Congress gets their hands on it. And we get to brainstorm together and co-create together. So it's not in final format. Um, even the com the composition of the Congress itself, it's, it's our proposal. So Anna Day and I are part of what we're calling the Founding Mothers Commission that's birthing the movement. And then as soon as the Congress convenes, which hopefully will be uh, July, we're going to hold the first congressional session, the Congress itself will decide uh, whether they like our Roberta's rules of order that we've developed and then 
set up the operational circles. We've also got geographic circles so we can watch the movement around the world. And um, yeah, the manifesto circle is really important. There's already seven lawyers involved. We've got seven female attorneys involved already from around the world. So I have no doubt that we're going to be able to draft a kick-ass piece of just poetry, frankly. I mean, it will be meant for policy and ready for adoption. It's, it's not going to be an airy-fairy document, although we're also very much pushing the unit of narrative that the evolutionary leaders, Jude Kuravan, was one of the primary authors of that. We absolutely believe in the the poetic version of the new story, but we're also going to need the legislative legal version so that when we say this is what you need to pass, it's done. They don't have to redraft it. We don't want them redrafting it. And to my knowledge, France is the only country that has passed a constitutional amendment that includes uh, reproductive rights for women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Veronica writes, uh, the principles of Ma'at should be represented. That would be in the spiritual group. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, we have various comments coming through, which we will get to. Um, I also noticed that Stacey Zeman is on the call. She's part of our commission. And I had yep. queued up her video to show yeah. what the vision is. So we could take a, a good time to take a break, Michael, to show the video. Oh, uh, sure, uh, sure. The vision of 2030 if the founding mothers are when the founding mothers are successful. So let me share my screen and play that video for everyone. And this was done by Stacy Zeman, who has become part of our, our group here. The year is 2030 and the Founding Mothers Movement has successfully shifted the paradigm. We have achieved a great victory. We have fully empowered women around the world and we have stopped an evil that no people before us were able to prevent. We have ended war. Women now have universal gender equity. Women have bodily autonomy and reproductive choice. Laws are in place to prevent child marriage. Cultures forbid family violence and genital mutilation. And relationships between women and men enter a field of understanding and compassion. For the first time in human history, our precious planet is at peace. The military industrial complex is now a peacekeeping force and men no longer are asked to kill their brothers. As a result, there is ample money available for health care, daycare, and elder care. Schools are being built around the world to educate all girls. Projects are bound and are fully funded to provide novel green infrastructure and protect the commons. Artificial intelligence is properly monitored and employed for benevolent projects that enhance life on Earth. Now Mother Earth can regenerate. Animal, plant, and ocean life are revived and add to the euphoria of this new golden age. All my relations, one of the original instructions, is a lesson taught in every school, along with mindfulness. There now exists a universal inner knowing that together we can accomplish anything. Planetary governance has reached a new level of inclusion, collaboration, and coordination. The nation state system yields to regional and local models of self organization. Intentional communities and cottage industries abound, creating self sufficient economies. Globalization now means that we are one species with one shared destiny. Personal freedom is intertwined with responsibility, which we gladly share as members of one human family. The new story is told far and wide. Our children know it by heart. Songs are written in its honor. Truth, love, and light reign on earth. As above, so below. Join the Founding Mothers Movement and help transform the world. Mm. And so... Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And that was Stacey yeah. Zeman, who is part of our group with the vision that we are holding forth and the vision that we want to spread around the world, the vision we know in our hearts is possible and we will do everything we can to bring that about. You wanna, you wanna know why I feel like we're being divinely guided? So I go Google to get the names founding mothers dot world earth and global are available then i google again women's congress dot earth global and world are available it, it's like it was meant to be it, it's just you know we're following the breadcrumbs the founding mothers commission all of us are and we're all contributing and doors just keep opening and opening and opening so if someone can get us to melinda gates who's now investing in women's rights, please, please let me know how to get through to her because that's what's been going on. It's almost like, it's not almost like the universe is supporting this. We have got to shift the trajectory. We have got to get on a different timeline. The timeline we're on right now is utter dystopia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are a hundred percent right, Laura. So, I was going to ask you or talk more about the backlash and Dave brought up earlier the backlash against feminism. I was going to bring up the backlash against democracy, but I'm going to table that or maybe bring it up a little war, a little while, because I'm watching the video. It reminded me of something I was telling you um, before we went live, Laura, and that about the, um, the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, and that we had this in this country before. America had the chance in the writing of the Constitution to put equality in the Constitution because the United States Constitution was based on the Iroquois Constitution. And the Iroquois believed that all people, all the peoples were equal. And actually, they put women on. It was somewhat of a matriarchal society because the women chose the chiefs. The women were the clan mothers and chose the chiefs and could remove the chiefs. And the birthplace of the women's suffragette movement, Seneca Falls, was in the heart of the Iroquois um, nation. And American women saw what the Haudenosaunee Iroquois had, and they wanted it too, and started agitating for women's rights. And, And one other thing on that was that when the American nation was was coming together, the Iroquois were asked if they wanted to be the 14th colony, the 13th colony, the Iroquois could have been the 14th colony. And that could have changed things, but they chose not to because they saw where America was going and the constitution was not um, declaring rights for all people. It was just for the rich white men, slaveholders, basically. So we had our opportunity. So this is our our chance for rebirth, for for once again, to, to bring it to what we had. So... I, I salute you, Laura, for your vision and for your for your impetus in doing this. Yeah, I, I feel, I think we talked about this, yeah, before we went live. Yeah, I feel such a strong connection to the founding fathers. Um, having been born in Virginia and the first presidents from here, George Washington, and then we've got, you know, Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence and James Madison is from Virginia and, and he did the first draft of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I just feel such a strong kinship with the founding fathers and we're not being disrespectful in this movement toward them. It's more like they got us only so far. They did a great job. You know, it was 250 years ago, they did a great job for back then. They could have done a little bit better on that slavery thing, but anyway. Um, and it's just time to finish the job. It's just time that, the, you know, and we just feel like women will bring that added sensitivity um, and we'll be the best judges of when we've achieved gender equity. I mean, women will tell you when we've achieved it. So it's more that the founding mothers are finishing the job than or elevating it. Um, so again, we're not, this isn't in any way an anti-male campaign. In fact, we can't do this without men. We can't do this without men. So they are gonna be key partners and facilitators and leaders as well. Um, But for the Women's Congress itself, we're gonna keep that all female. We've talked a lot about that in the Founding Mothers Commission and 
we think it should go down in the history books this way that it was a woman-led movement that shifted the paradigm well you know greenham commons in England, sorry the history books yes the history books <laughs> greenham commons in england was a women's led movement that went on for 19 years to protest the storage of nuclear warheads on a particular site and they camped out they started with uh 33 women and four men and their ranks swell, uh, swelled to 70,000 camping out year round on this fenced you know on the outside of the fence around where these nuclear warheads were going to be stored and they carried it on for 19 years until finally they won and the warheads were taken away and it's now a public park but mm -hmm. uh in my my peace uh peace video i talk about this and how they how their strategy was but it took 19 years and you know england winters are not pleasant to camp out in yeah. they didn't have bathrooms they didn't have cooking facilities you know they took shifts and it started out with men part of it and then for a while they said no this needs to be just women and it seems like it was the women that were staying and mm -hmm. um like i say their ranks swelled to seventy thousand at the top of it and That's but they terrible. just kept on for 19 years until it was closed and made into a park so it can be done with determination yes uh, what is a way to support you a way to support the founding mothers movement what can people do who want to get involved who want to help give it wings um talk about that if you could sure well at this stage we're beta testing the website so it's still not completed we have the individual sign up portal ready to go. So as an individual, you can sign up now, get into the database, uh, receive the newsletter. When we start it, we haven't even started the newsletter yet. Um, the partner portal, which is critical because this is the database we're building to map and monitor uh, a global movement that should be up and running hopefully in another week. So, if you lead an organization, you would use the partner portal to join the movement. And if you're an individual who wants to join, again, that's already up and running. It's on the website on the Join Us page. Um, obviously, another way to help is to volunteer. We're going to need a lot of volunteers. The Oracle Institute is too small to handle this. So as more nonprofits join, um we're absolutely going to be asking for assistance um another way to help of course is with money um right now it's being done almost all volunteer and you know some people can can do that because they're retired and and they can contribute their time like money and other people are still working and might have more money than time um and we're going to have to hire staff eventually. I mean, there's just no way we're going to have to hire staff eventually. So financial contributions are another way to assist. Um, and spreading the word, the women's, pardon, spreading the word. Well, yeah. So one of the circles we're going to talk about, we're having actually having our next founding mothers commission meeting tomorrow. We meet every Wednesday. Um, there's a couple circles we got to get up and running and that media circle. Woo. I'll tell you what we need are some young women who love social media um, because yes, it's we're pretty much there. It's time to start priming the pump for the launch. And, you know, we're going to need a press release pretty soon. So, you know, depending on what your skill set is, we'll, we'll happily take your assistance. Yeah, so we've got an we'll have an email set up, uh, volunteer at foundingmothers.world. Um so yeah, just let us know. Write us and let us know how you'd like to assist. Yeah, it's foundingmothers.world is the website. And it isn't finished yet, and our, our intro video is not completely done yet, but uh we're close and we're gonna launch February 24th. Oh, and I mean June 24th, and maybe you can talk about the women's strike that Danielle yes. is starting. Right. We wanted to initially we wanted to launch on Mother's Day and we could, couldn't quite make that deadline. And then this young woman from Texas posted on Facebook, hey, we need a women's strike on June 24th because that's the two year anniversary of the Dobbs decision when they overruled Roe. 
and it's caught fire. It's going viral. So um, I got, I can't remember if I learned about it through Women's March. Um, so we reached out to her immediately. Her name is Danielle Goodwin, and she's now a founding mother. She's joining us now on Wednesdays. And it was her little brainchild that has gone live around the world. You can um, go to Women's March and post your event. We're going to have an event here at the Peace Pentagon at 3 o'clock that day. So it's not a protest. It's a strike. Women are being asked not to go to work if that's feasible. And if you're not, you know, like a nurse where you, you're taking care of others. Um, women are also being asked not to shop. That's the biggie. Don't buy anything. Don't use your credit card. And that will that there's a, there will be an economic impact if, if women do that um everyone's being asked to wear red to show solidarity and have i forgotten anything in a day i think those are the main things that I it's a real strike if you if you're a student not to go to school yes yeah yes and no sex <laughs> As the old greek list list stereo uh, uh, anyway. yeah yeah this is strata play yeah, this is, um, what is the ancient Greek play by Aristophanes, where during the Trojan War, the women all decided on both sides of the aisle, yes. both sides of the war, the women got together and said, we're tired of this. We don't want to lose our husbands and sons to this war. And we are not going to have sex until the men lay down their arms. And of course, it's only a fictional play, but they joined forces, they did it, and the men put down their arms and a grand celebration was had. Yes. And then Spike Lee updated it. I'm trying to remember the name of his movie. It came out about 15 years ago. Um, he updated it. Mm. with It was the gangs and the women on both sides of the gangs, the girlfriends on both sides to get the men to stop fighting. Same thing. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the movie. I'm sorry. Anyway. Um, yes. So no sex either. If, you're, if your man's being naughty, mm -mm, mm -mm. he needs to know we need equal rights. He needs to start voting the right way. <laughs> Michael, do you think we should open up to questions from the audience at this point? Uh, sure. I, and just, I, I put in the chat box the timetable from, from the website suggested timetable of major campaigns. So, you know, you've already got this strategy laid out, including it's the- It's a real plan. It's a yeah. real plan. And one of the things we're going to do is march from the Peace Pentagon to the War Pentagon. Gandhi Salt March took 24 days. I've calculated it. We could walk from here to Arlington, Virginia in 25 days. And there's some really interesting places to pit stop and camp for the night, like the Trump Winery outside of Charlottesville. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to, before we open it up, I just want to bring up again the, the backlash against democracy that I mentioned earlier. You know, what we're seeing now is this, this rabid right wing just saying democracy is getting in the way of our vision of their vision and so that's they're 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 in the minority but they want to hold on that backlash against egalitarianism against feminism and democracy and so you know the supreme court is it is it quite the example of it of um you know that six person super majority handing down rule after rule you know, Dobbs was one and many others. Um, so, but they are in the minority. And I think, you know, as as you are mm -hmm. articulating, Laura, and, and laying out a plan, it takes a movement to, to go up against fighting the power, really, which is, again, the minority. But they are ardent backlash. So in integral theory, what we're talking about is amassing power in the third quadrant and the fourth quadrant are institutions. The fourth, quad fourth quadrant is the collective we having manifested institutions and systems of government and processes. So the theory behind movements is you focus on the third quadrant first because you don't have enough elected officials in the fourth quadrant to implement the change you seek. So it's the we quadrants of culture and values and the soft parts of life that are the juicy parts. And we absolutely believe the consciousness level is there. So if we can amass the power in the third quadrant, we can assist on change in the fourth quadrant. That's, that's part of the plan as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. And democracy is at the top of the list. That's th that's one of our core values. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, if I go back in some of the comments, um, we haven't really had time, but Fred, who is often a, a participant in these calls, he says, I haven't heard any women talk about the negative psychological impact of a woman who is forced to carry a baby to term, uh, to full term birth, especially if she is a victim of rape or incest and the negative impact of the daily reminder of this violence, then the negative psychological impact on the newborn who unconsciously knows that it is unwanted. And this is such an important part of the story. You know, I wrote a blog uh, when this happened, you know, I wrote a blog about an abortion I had at 19 in college that resulted from a rape. And it wasn't, it was 1972. It was a year before abortion was made legal across the land. I was in college in Massachusetts. It was illegal in New York, so it wasn't that far. I had to quit school, go out and get a job to earn enough money to go take a train in a hotel room in New York and pay for an abortion. And I told this whole story and I got emails like, you're disgusting, you don't deserve to live because I shared that story. And now other people you know, said, thank you for sharing it. You know, it wasn't across the board, but it was quite amazing, you know, and it is, and it's great that a man can see into that that trauma for the woman and for the child his whole life. I've had clients who knew they were the result of a rape and it it messed them up psychologically. Hmm. Wow, and a day I did not know that story about you. I am so sorry. Um and in addition to the violent scenario, which is the worst of all, a rape or an incest scenario. There are accidents and the men are impacted too, right? Who wants to be a father at 15 or 16? And, you know, the guys have no say in the matter whatsoever. Um, and this has impacted my family. We've had this situation in my family and it impacts every, everyone involved, everyone involved. Their life, their life is altered forever. Mm -hmm. And so even for an accident, a mistake, uh, a night of sex with that's not protected and there's a, a pregnancy that wasn't planned or wanted, that is reason enough for a woman to have the right to continue on with her life, to continue on with her journey in a way that, that is appropriate for her. So... Yeah, there is actually a, stati a statistically measurable drop in crime 20 years after Roe v. Wade was passed. And it is some people say that because unwanted children weren't coming into the world and being born into poverty because the mother didn't have it together to provide for them and didn't have a father and all the reasons that are there for young women, um, that we didn't have as much psychological damage that a generation later was showing up as a drop in crime. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Not at all. And and there's probably a correlation between that and what we're seeing with young men now, that there is an epidemic of suicide. Um, young men are having a hard time understanding their place in society. So this lack of partnership is confusing everybody. It's, it's creating an environment in which dating is now really uncomfortable if it happens at all. In fact, wasn't it you, Anade, who told the story of um, high school girls are now getting choked because mm -hmm. boys are turning to pornography and they think that that's normal, that you choke a woman during sex. Right. Um, so that's a thing now in high schools. Um, just our culture is sick. Our culture is sick in multiple ways. But the Christian version of how to solve that problem isn't working and certainly shouldn't be imposed on the rest of us. And it's not, and I don't even want to say Christian, it's a minority Christian view. Yes. Most Catholics are pro-choice. Most Christians are pro-choice. So the Supreme Court has, you know, indoctrinated as, has, enforce a minority christian view on when life begins it's absolutely religious in nature in fact that's one of the things in the founding mother's uh strategic plan is that we need to bring a lawsuit 
under the First Amendment. Roe was decided under the 14th Amendment. They found a privacy right under the 14th Amendment. We now have a clear argument of religious discrimination and Jewish people in particular are all over it. They're filing lawsuits all over the country saying, you are violating my religious rights by taking my right away to bodily autonomy and deciding when I want to start a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it's under the religious realm for sure. So yeah, I think I think we need a First Amendment lawsuit. I really do. At the national level. And yes, I know we'll be up before this Supreme Court, but it, it's just so obvious that uh, I think even the this that group of clowns in the majority can be embarrassed into admitting that they are um violating the First Amendment mm -hmm. by backing one religious view. Yeah. Um, we have some other comments. Are you getting any in the Q and A, Michael, or comments? Uh, nothing in the Q and A. It's all in the chat. Yeah. So, um, just recently, Marie asked, "Thank you. Maybe there might be some Roman Catholic women who are fed up with the Vatican's refusal to allow women to be priests, who can also join the Women's Strike Day." Yeah. And I just read an article yesterday about the um, e evangelical Christians wanting to take away the right of women to be priests, and they're voting on that this week. They're having a big, huge national council. Um, the Baptist. Yeah, it's split. Yeah. It's already split other, um, I'm trying to remember which one, what other Protestant. Um, the Catholic comment, I just want to say that I was raised Catholic. And I remember, and it was either, I think it was first grade, second grade, the priest coming into the room, and I actually attended Catholic school when I was little, saying, who wants to be an altar attendant? I remember raising my hand and him going, oh, no, no, honey. Let me tell you, I checked out of Catholicism that day. I think I was maybe seven. I was like, that's it. I'm done with this religion. So even at that age, I could tell the misogyny embedded. And yes, the nuns on the bus were a great period of time. I don't think the nuns on the bus are traveling anymore. No, women need to just walk out of that church, period. Flat out. Until they open up that all, all boys club at the Vatican, women need hmm. to walk out the door. That's the only thing that's going to change that church. Women taking their rights. Yeah. Uh, so you here, have your questions in the chat or in the Q&A? Here, here's something from uh, Grace. She wrote a little while ago. We can inspire men to embrace male inner power and empowerment and fulfillment based on inner strength and integrity, based on love and empathic, wise protectorship. Mm -hmm. Love that word, protector. Love that word. I think every woman, every woman wants to think of men as protectors and safe. And oh, oh, my daughter was telling me there was a meme going around. I don't know if it was on TikTok. There was a question that said, if you're in the woods camping or you're hiking alone, would you rather run into a, a man you don't know or a bear? And women were hitting bear. Like, I can't remember a statistic. It would like, overwhelmingly, they would have rather face a bear than a strange man. What does that say? I mean, we're just, things are just so skewed. So the partnership piece is critical. It's just so critical. And it's not about, again, trying to substitute some sort of matriarchal system for the patriarchal one that is fighting to the death to hold on to power. It truly is about entering this new era of gender relations. And that's what fifth wave feminism, they're defining it right now. Fifth wave feminism is about gender equity. And so many men are saying, heck yeah, because they see what the issues are. They they get that they can't that's be right. sensitive. They can't be open. They can't, in, in a culture which has still got a macho, you know, thematic running through it. Those archetypes are are old and they need to go away. And now I want to plug your archetype <laughs> that, that you sent me. Oh my God. I was doing that with my daughter this weekend. We were picking out, yeah, and a day, what is it? It's she rises cards. Yeah, what do they call? She rises. Oh, they're so good. They're so good. Yeah. And they're all about the new archetypes that we need. Yeah. 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 
so yeah, feminine archetypes that, you know, women lead differently than men. But I, you know, I've done circles where men have picked up these archetype cards and read them and embodied the I poem and have burst into tears and have had been shaking and just found such an opening in them because they were not allowed to have any of this in themselves. So this system of patriarchy that we have does not really serve men. It uses them. Yes. It uses them. And it's tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And treats them like tin soldiers when someone wants to make war. Yeah. Like it's a game. Like it's a yeah. freaking video game. Yeah. It's sick. It's sick. It doesn't work for anyone. And it's time to change. And enough of us know this now, right? In this in this interconnected world, people are have pieced it all together. And they're in touch with, you know, whether you lead with your masculine, which I tend to do, <laughs> or you're a man who leads with his feminine side. We just all want to be who we are and we want a world in which we can flourish and rejoice and it's just it's back to Stacy's video what the world could look like by 2030 if we all get our act together and say enough it's over done we're done with this new paradigm yeah and and speaking of Stacy she put in the um chat box she said i think listeners might want to hear about how the founding mothers movement will help shift the misogynist thinking brainwashing and indoctrination that affects so many women around the world so perhaps say something on that. Well, I'm going to ask your listeners to go to this website called End Gender Apartheid. Mm -hmm. So powerful, this website. And it was put up by Iraqi and Afghani women. So they are not afraid. I mean, and, and they live in a culture where they could be physically harmed, right? For acting out. For showing their hair um so i guess in response to stacy's comment i would just say that it's a global yearning now it's global it's not just women in america who are pissed off it's global all women have had it enough is enough if an alien spaceship landed on planet earth the first thing they would look at and see is the misogyny they go wait wait scratching their head like what maybe they have two heads what you treat half the planet as a secondary class of citizens it's insane it is literally insane and for those who are spiritual if you haven't checked out the hermetic path the seven laws of the universe start with the law of gender they're nested and then the last one out is the mind of god the very first law is the law of gender this planet hasn't even assimilated that yet so enough with the barbarity, enough with the unconscious, you know, urge driven cravings of power and greed, like enough, enough. We've had enough profits and avatars come. We can get in touch with that alignment on our own. We don't, we don't even need another avatar to come. We know the vast majority of humans on the planet know right from wrong and want it. fairness, justice, equality because all of that brings happiness for everyone studies have shown that in countries that have more gender equity there is less violence there is less money spent on the military and even where there is violence it's less severe and so just having the gender equity brings a more peaceful society uh, marie says bill maher just recently mentioned gender apartheid in a recent show and that is what and she says that's what the campus protesters should really be addressing mm -hmm. yeah i love bill maher he can go off in a weird direction sometimes but yeah Certainly. yeah no it is gender apartheid and that term is getting more and more usage now the first time i heard it i was like wow that's interesting gender apartheid but the more you think about it it's true in almost every country, I don't know if we can even point out one where this isn't the case, women are second class citizens still, whether it's pay inequity, you know, it might look semi benign, but no, it's not benign. None of this is fair. None of this is just. And then we've got extreme examples. We've got sisters walking around in 100 degree, 120 degree heat in the Middle East in the desert, covered in black with just little slits for their eyes. I mean, enough. It's ridiculous. <laughs>
And Michael asked a question, and Stacy looks like she answered it. So I'll just bring it to people's attention. Michael asked, "How are people finding it about finding out about Oracle and what is going on on the twenty fourth? And how are people finding out about that date?" And Stacy gave the website address of foundingmothers.world and also oracleinstitute.org. It's in the chat box. But um, uh, Laura, perhaps you could say more also about the twenty fourth. Well, first off, we need a media team. I'm going to underscore that. We need a media team for Founding Mothers Movement. Um, so if you haven't heard about it, that's one of the reasons why. We haven't really launched uh, the media circle yet. The strike has its own website. Um, if you Google uh, Women's Strike June 24th, it will come up, uh, Danielle's website. And you can also find out about it on Women's March website and you can post your own event for that day but again it's a strike not a protest and just let people know let women know and men do don't shop that day you know let it be known wear red people ask you why you're not going to work tell them why um so yeah it's the it's the two-year anniversary of when they took away our bodily autonomy in the united states and Danielle, it's kind of actually, a big deal. Danielle actually started this idea. Um, Danielle Goodwin, who started the women's strike based on uh, what happened in Iceland in the mid 70s, yeah. the women went on strike. And, you know, Iceland's a small country. So really, I think 90 some percent of the population participated. They didn't do child care. They didn't go to work. They didn't spend money. And they brought down the corruption that was going on and they instituted the first woman president. Yep. Yeah. Which reminds me, and there they, was a question that came by earlier. What do you, th from Marie, what do you think about Mexico electing the first female president in North America? Well, it's cool on paper, but I've been doing a little digging into her and apparently she was the chosen one of, uh, the prior president who has really assisted the decline in democracy in Mexico. So let us not be fooled. Just because you put lipstick on doesn't make you all touchy feely and in tune with the highest of human values. And I'm not saying she's not a good person. I've just started researching about her, but um, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of women out there marjorie taylor green for instance would we want her to be our first president okay point me hell no yeah. yeah 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 so there's a uh we just put up a uh, link for the women's strike and uh anything else michael or anything else anyone wants to ask uh, oh um yeah you you had written a book laura the yeah. light and the new human so I could, mm -hmm. so could you tell us what you mean by a new human and what are their core beliefs? Yes, that is the third book in the Oracle trilogy. And the book actually supports, it's got a lot of the research that we've been talking about today. It supports the notion that humanity collectively is ready for the shift. But the barrier is, again, that fourth quadrant. So people are ahead of, of their institutions we're we're morally spiritually and for in in, in any way you you want to measure morality we're ahead of where our institutions are it's like it's like move you know the titanic's going for the iceberg and it's hard to turn the wheel so the light and the he knew human although it, well i have a chapter in there on um the fourth turning because I wanted people to understand the cycles and, uh, and seasons of history. I've got a chapter in there on the spectrum of consciousness, which is really, that's the whole book up. Um, so, the, and there's there's a lot about going into the void. For those of you who are spiritual, it's a, con, a condensing of my 25 year journey into um, the enlightenment process. And that is my goal. I would like to leave this, this life, um, having touched bliss more than the few times I have, I do believe in that concept. Um, it's a lot. There's a lot in that book. <laughs> and anyways, I'll just sum it up by saying the book itself um, is proof positive that the Founding Mothers Movement 
has more than a chance at success. I really believe we can do this. I really, really do. And it's the wild card scenario that's needed. I don't know anybody else. I mean, people are working, of course, of course, on, on issues, but this takes us out of working, like playing defense and playing offense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right on. Uh, I sent out notice of this to many people and a friend of mine, Carolyn Pearson, who had a one woman show for years called Mother Wove the Morning. She wanted to support this with a poem. And I wonder if I could read this. She's sure. The poem called To All Women Everywhere. Let us sing a lullaby to the heads of state. They are our little boys grown up and they have forgotten the sound of their mother's voice and they need to be sat in the corner or given a good shaking. Are they too big for that? Then let us sing until their fingers fall from the fateful button. And they put the guns and tanks back in the toy box and remember that their mother told them, we do not hurt one another. Let us sing until they close their eyes and dream a better dream. Let us sing to them of peace. Mm. Beautiful. By Carolyn Pearson. And completely accurate. We're all living a nightmare right now. Let's just stop dreaming this dream. It, yeah. That's it is happen. so simple in so many ways. Yeah. 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 It sure is. And just uh, how we muck it up. Yeah. How so muck it up. I shouldn't say. I love the new story in that poem. Thank you. That was beautiful. And it's it's telling how we got here too. Anyway, they're bad habits and it's not going to be easy to break them, but I just don't think it's going to be as hard as people think it will be if we all pull together, if the women of this world pull together, particularly with our brothers, again, who are working on peace in the spiritual realm and environmentalism. I mean, of course we can do this. Of course. Let's build the mother of all movements, people. Let's do it. Let's do it. You know, and it's often said about movements that they take longer than you think they could, and then they happen faster than you thought was possible. Hmm. And it's going to take wisdom. That peace room is sophisticated as a war room. I mean, Gandhi in his autobiography talked about his Himalayan, his words, quote, Himalayan miscalculation that led to the massacre of Calcutta. So... Yeah, even when when you think you're winning and you're you're progressing the movement in as as gentle and benevolent a way as possible, nonviolent, other wild card things can come in, and I, we don't need to go into the what he considered to be the miscalculation. But yeah, the women in that peace room need to be so wise, yeah. so wise. Because this could get weird. It could get weird. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's end on the positive note of what. Yeah, we're, we're going to do it. Let's all hold this vision and give Laura support for all that she is holding as she births this and is birthing this in a collaborative way, but it's not easy. And it is coming. We all know labor is not easy when we're in birth. And uh, we need the support. So let's all give support to the Founding Mothers Movement. And Take a moment of silence for this. And then check out the website and get involved. Yeah. And right now your archetype card midwife is what came to me in that moment of silence. We're all birthing this. Yes. We're all midwifing the new world. Yeah. The men are too. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This has been fun. This has been Thank great. you, Laura. Let's all do it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. And we'll see you next time. Okay. And it's been Laura George from the Peace Pentagon and Oracle Institute and the Founding Mothers Movement. And we are voices for the future. Yeah. yeah. Here's to the future. All right. It's going to be our symbol for women in war. I thought uh, of that the other night. The triple. Yeah. The triple guys. Yeah, the triple. <laughs> Although right. someone told me that was in Hunger Games.
Uh, oh dear. <laughs> All right. Peace out. All right. Bye. Bye.